Okay, we're going to look at Lenny in of Mice and Men today. Um, this is by no means exhaustive. Um, we're just trying to highlight a few things that you could say about how Steinbeck portrays him in the novella. Okay. Um, first of all, then, uh, it's worth looking at the first description of him that you get on the second page of the novel. Um, and it, one of the first things that you'll notice is the contrast between George and Lenny. So George is described as as quite small and um, he's got very defined features um, and uh, whereas Lenny has, is described as shapeless of face uh, and he's huge physically. Um, so it actually says behind him walked his opposite. Um, so the two characters are, uh, characters are very much portrayed as opposites. What I think is interesting, though, is actually just before that, what Steinbeck does is emphasize how similar they are. So if you look at the description, it says both, both both so both wore denim trousers for instance both had their blanket rolls slung over their shoulders steinbeck actually i know he goes on to emphasize how different they are but he actually emphasizes how similar they are as well and the things that mark them as similar are a uniform basically the trousers the, the denim trousers are, are the the kind of trousers that a, a working man would wear in the 1930s so it kind of marks them as my typical migrant workers, itinerant workers. And so what Steinbeck is doing is he's he's positioning them within what he calls this microcosm, this microcosmic representation of reality. He's saying, look, here are two migrant workers. Let's see what happens to them. Um, Lenny, right from the beginning, there's this animal imagery describing the, the way he moves, the things that he does. Um, and there's there he's linked to various animals in terms of the images that Steinbeck uses during the course of the novel. But at this point, it's a bear. So it says he was dragging his feet a little the way a bear drags his paws. Um, and it's worth looking at uh, the, the different moments where this animal imagery is used. And you'll find lots of them as you look through the novel, but not just saying in an essay, look, Steinbeck use it Steinbeck uses lots of animal imagery here you've got to think well okay so what is he trying to show through that what's he trying to suggest and it will vary depending on the description and depending on the animal and the context in which he's making that that link but it could be that he's trying to describe Lenny as a very impulsive character perhaps a bit like an animal is quite impulsive maybe here it's the his sheer size and he's physically strong maybe maybe the idea of him being unpredictable and dangerous in the way that an animal often is. Um, maybe the idea of him having limited mental capacity, maybe the idea of being quite innocent. You know, an animal can can hurt you, but not out of any maliciousness, just because, well, that's what animals do. So there's a kind of, there's an innocence to um, uh, the, 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 Lenny, the, the Lenny's violence at times, isn't there? Okay, uh, the rest of chapter one, um, I, again, there are so many things that you could mention here, but I've just tried to sort of pick out three or four. The first is he's described as being remarkably childlike, and I, you could pick out so many examples for this. But I picked out the way in which he wiggles his fingers. It says, you wiggled his fingers so the water rose in little splashes. And I love that wiggled word. It just kind of really emphasizes how, you know, you can sort of picture a little, a little child wiggling their fingers in the water, can't you? And just enjoying the sensation and looking at the, the ripples that their fingers are creating. Um, it's a very, very childlike, innocent image there, isn't it? The other thing I think is interesting is if you look at the dialogue, and of course the dialogue in the novel is so important, isn't it, um, is how often Lenny uses George's name. Um, so constantly he'll say, George this, George that. Look how many times Lenny uses his name, particularly during the course, course of chapter one, but throughout the novel. Um, and if you think about it, that's a very much a feature of child-parent interaction, isn't it? If you look at a father and child or mother and child, talking to each other they'll use each other's names a lot it will be constantly mummy daddy mummy daddy 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 um and that, that's the way that um that lenny is interacting with george is constantly george 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 look how many times he uses his name and that i think that's steinbeck emphasizing that it's it's kind of like a father-son relationship really with george in lots of ways you could term it in other ways um but uh, to me a, a lot of it is to do with it being like a father-son relationship and we've got other evidence for that. Look at how he imitates him. Um, I love the bit where it says Lenny, who had been watching, imitated George exactly. He pushed himself back, drew up his knees, embraced them, looked over to George to see whether he had it just right. Um, 
Lenny uh, is very dependent on George, isn't he, to to know how to behave in certain social contexts and situations, isn't he? Um, he doesn't he doesn't know even how to lie down, how to position his body, how to what to do with his head, what to do with his hat, what to you know certainly not what to say and 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 whatever in in situations either whether he's with other people or or wherever um so he's very dependent on copying george isn't he um and that dependence i think is is very much emphasized throughout the whole of the first chapter another example of it will be when george says um i want you to stay with me lenny jesus christ somebody shoot you for a coyote if you was by yourself um you know, that's when Lenny is talking about going off up into the caves. And I think Steinbeck really emphasises Lenny's dependence on George here. And it's a structural decision on his part. I think that's the most important point to make here, because what he's doing is he's laying the groundwork for that in chapter one and saying, look, it's OK so long as Lenny and George are together, as long as Lenny's with George, as long as George is there to look out for him, to tell him what to say, tell him what to do, stop him getting into trouble, everything will be OK. OK, but he's completely dependent on him. OK, and the moment George isn't there, well, that's when you need to start to get worried. And so what you're waiting for, because you know it's happened before, OK, you're waiting for that to happen again, aren't you? You're waiting for that moment when George won't be with Lenny because he can't be with him 24 hours a day. So you're kind of thinking, when's it going to happen? When is George going to go off somewhere else for a bit and Lenny's going to be left on his own? What is going to happen? And so what Steinbeck does is lays the, 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 the groundwork for that so that as a reader, you're prepared for that moment to occur. So that the moment you see Lenny on his own, the tension starts to rise. If Steinbeck hadn't emphasised Lenny's dependence on George right at the beginning of the novel, then that wouldn't have been created. You wouldn't have you wouldn't have thought twice about Lenny being on his own. It, Steinbeck lays the groundwork for it at this point. And then finally, the dream. Um, <clears throat> have a look through George and Lenny recounting the dream um, towards the end of, of the first section. And uh, to me, one of the most interesting things here, and I just the, one of the loveliest moments of the novel is uh, Lenny's interruptions. You know, and he, he, George will be midstream, won't he? Um, and Lenny will interrupt with, and live off the fat of the land. Um, and George says at one point, you know, you know it yourself, you can say it. And, and Lenny says, no, it's not the same if I, if I say it. You know, it's, I've got to listen to you say it. But <clears throat> there are several points, aren't there, where... Lenny interrupts him and, and, and butts in with these key lines. Um, and to me, that makes it seem like a bedtime story. Um, if you think about uh, bedtime stories and fairy tales and things like that, that, that maybe you were told when, when you were younger, that there are lines, aren't there? Like, run, run as fast as you can. You can't catch me, I'm the gingerbread man. Or I'll huff and I'll puff and I'll blow your house down. Think about those kind of lines where an adult might would have been reading you the story, telling you the story. And then as a child, that's the bit that you join in on because you know that bit. That's what Lenny's doing here. He's like a little child listening to a bedtime story, butting in with those bits that he remembers and that he loves. OK, and it really emphasises it again, the father child relationship thing. OK, but it also emphasises it that the whole thing, the whole thing about buying the ranch um, and you know, having a bit of independence and living on this place together is just a fantasy. It's just a fairy tale. Um, and the last slide here is to do with uh, how Steinbeck uses Lenny as a narrative tool. It's always interesting to look at how a writer uses a character in the novel, not just thinking, how are they described? Because if that's all you're talking about, you're kind of falling into the trap of thinking about them as a real person. And they're not. They're a construct of the author. Um, and so here I, I've jotted down four, four things. The first is he is someone to exploit. And even George exploits his position of power over him. Um, if you look at uh, chapter three, um, look at the little Sacramento River story where um, George is talking to Slim and he says about once he and Lenny were up with a bunch of guys by the Sacramento River and, and George tells Lenny to, to jump in. And Lenny jumps and uh, he can't swim. 
and uh, George has to go in and, and save him. Uh, and George says he learned from that experience that he, you know, he hasn't done like anything like that again. OK, but um, he recognizes that it was a moment where he he exploited that power. He abused his position of authority, if you like, over Lenny. Another example will be in chapter four when everyone else has gone off to, into Soledad for the evening and Crooks' light is on in his, his little hut by the side of the barn, isn't it? And uh, Lenny goes in and he says, oh, I've seen your light. And they start chatting, don't they? Crooks doesn't want him in there to start with, but he says, oh, yeah, OK, well, you might as well sit down. And they start talking and Crooks realises the extent of Lenny's learning difficulties, doesn't he? And um, he realises he can say anything he wants to to Lenny. And he starts to say, just suppose, suppose George don't come back. Suppose, what, what do you think they do to you? Just, just suppose George don't come back. Suppose he, suppose he gets hurt and he can't, he can't come back. You know, and he, he really starts laying into Lenny, doesn't he? And enjoying the look of fear that's coming onto, onto Lenny's face. And at one point in chapter four, it actually says, Crook's face lighted with pleasure in his torture. I don't know about you, but that's kind of, I find that quite shocking. And I find it quite shocking because obviously Crooks, because of his race, because of the racism, and particularly evident in 1930s America, that's what Steinbeck's trying to highlight, isn't it? But because of that, Crooks is, you'd probably say, the least powerful person on the ranch. He knows what it's like to be excluded. He knows what it's like to, um, uh, you know, to be treated very differently, purely on the grounds of race. And yet when he is then in a position to abuse someone else, when he's in a position to exploit his intellectual power, if you like, over Lenny, OK, he uses it. And he doesn't just use it, but he actually gains pleasure from it. It's his crook's face lighted with pleasure in his torture. I think that tells you quite a lot about society in 1930s America. It kind of tells you what a kind of harsh, ruthless, everyone looking out for themselves kind of society this is. OK, where even the downtrodden, even the oppressed, in fact, maybe especially the oppressed, when they get an opportunity to oppress others, they will seize it. OK, so they, the, 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 the weakest, the most vulnerable, the most powerless members of society, when they get an, an opportunity to rise up over someone else by pushing them down, they grab it with both hands. OK, what a harsh society this is that Steinbeck is describing. Secondly, he's someone to talk to. Um, and you can see that in chapter four and chapter five. In chapter four, Look at how Crooks completely opens up about his life, all about his childhood and all about being uh, uh, a, a, the only black person in the neighbourhood and, you know, all to do with his family and all to do with living on the ranch um, and, you know, his, his, his experiences. Crooks just talks and talks and talks and talks because he realises that Lenny probably won't remember any of it and he won't say anything back. It's like a free counselling session, isn't it, for crooks? It's just someone to talk to and to open up completely to. And look at Curly's wife again in chapter five. She never gets to talk to anyone because everyone is so immediately suspicious of her, aren't they? Um, they're very much on guard the moment they see her, uh, you know, standing in the doorway. But she finally finds someone that she can open up to about how uh, dysfunctional her marriage is with Curly, uh, how unhappy she is, how, you know, all of her dreams about being a movie star and how disillusioned she is. She really opens her heart, doesn't she, in that moment before she then is killed. But look at how both of them seize that opportunity to talk to Lenny. And so what Steinbeck is doing is he's using Lenny as a narrative tool in those moments to show how desperately lonely everyone is. So that actually, when when they when Crooks and Cully's wife finally get someone to talk to, it's just this huge outpouring of emotion, isn't it? Which they never get to um, to, to vent and to pour out in any other context. OK, number three, um, look at the interactions that Lenny has with others. A lot of them lead to conflict and tension. Obviously, look at the interaction with the girl in weed. 
then the interview with the boss that gets very tense doesn't it at times obviously the fight with curly that's the sort of the beginning of the end you could argue and the conversation with crooks almost results in in lenny assaulting crooks before before crooks backs off doesn't he um look at the conversation with curly's wife and obviously that that in effect causes the death of the dream doesn't it any of these interactions with Lenny lead to conflict and to tension, don't they? Um, and I think Steinbeck uses those moments to just move the novel forward towards its inevitable conclusion of death and despair. Yeah. Um, and then finally, um, look at Lenny as a symbol of innocence, a kind of representation of a childlike mindset of hope. Uh, and in the harsh world of 1930s America, you could argue that when George shoots Lenny at the end, one of the reasons why maybe he has to is he comes to the realization that there is no hope, that this is a world of despair, that the American dream was just a myth, just a fantasy. And so in shooting Lenny, he's shooting innocence, he's shooting hope and he's facing reality.